I was coming out from my house in the Jewish quarter in the old city, and I saw a group of Americans, middle-aged people, and I usually go over and speak to them, which is a very pleasant thing to do. And this group, I asked them, where do you come from? They said, we come from Texas. Oh, we have something in common. What is that? We both have one star on our flag. A very impressive Israeli knew that Texas is a lone star state. And then one woman says to me, asked me, are you Jewish? I said, I'm not Jewish. And they're very surprised. I'm not Jewish? I said, let me explain to you. Unless you have something color red, but it's not really red, but it tends to be red. What do we call it? Reddish. Yellow. Not really yellow, but it tends to be yellow. We call it yellowish. I'm not Jewish. I'm a Jew. There's a difference. In Israel, you're a Jew. Outside, you're Jewish. And that makes the whole difference. It depends what you want to be, how much do you want to be a Jew? Or do you want to be Jewish? The choice in your hand. Be the historical person. That has a continuation from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and giving of the Torah on Mount Sinai, and coming into the land of Israel, and to all the time, the thousand years of here, and the, of the temple, and the, and the high priest, and all Jewish history. You want to be part of that? Then you have to be a Jew. It's not enough to be Jewish. If you be Jewish, you're going to go the way of all, all, all things. Judaism is like a big river, like the Mississippi, a big river that nobody can stop. If you're in the middle of the river, you continue on. If you're on the side of it, and just got sidetracked, and you dry up, and that happened to many people in, in the Galut. Many, many people, I knew how the numbers are. Many people uh, went away, assimilation, and Jews, Jews were killed. Let me give you an example, another example. Let's say you have a pile, a huge pile, metal shavings and wood and some sawdust. Huge part, big. And you have to ask to take out the metal shavings from the wood. You could sit your whole life long and never finish. So there are three ways that you can do it. One way is to blow. A big, big wind takes away the lighter pieces of wood and leaves the metal shavings. Or you can burn it. The wood burns and stuff, the metal is left. Or a magnet. When it comes to the Jewish people, there are three ways that God is able to distinguish between the, between the, uh, the authentic Jew and between those who are just hanging on. One is by the wind. The wind is assimilation. You go out. The other way is, unfortunately, fire, which was, we know what that means. The other is the magnet. The magnet is you feel an attraction to the Holy Land, then you are an authentic Jew. And this is the test that we have in every generation, not just this generation. In the United States, according to what I understand, which I read, any number of Jews that you say that there are five million, six million, half of them are non-halachic Jews. Either they became Jews through reform conversion, or the reform conservative recognized the patriarchal uh, lineage. If your father is Jewish, then you are Jewish. But that's not a halachic Jew. So any number you say in America, half of them are not Jewish. Add to that 70% of intermarriage of those who are Jewish, what do you live with in America? Jewish people are going down, going down. There's no question now the future of Judaism, of historical and religious Judaism, is in the original land of Israel. It took us many years to come back here, 2,000 years. And along this time, there's this replacement theology of Christianity that they replaced the Jewish people as God's chosen people. In other words, there was a recognition that we were God's chosen people, but now take a look at our situation in the world. Obviously, God's replacing Jews with Christianity. Then the Muslims came and they say, we replaced both of you. And then came the Shoah, which gave credence to all these claims that we are not no longer God's chosen people. And all of a sudden, three years later, after Auschwitz, comes the Jewish state. How did that come about? As the hand of God. 600,000 people. The next day after declaring the state, were invaded by seven standing armies. We had no planes. We had no tanks. There was no way that we could survive here. And we, been, we won that. We, we, we won the, the, the war. We extended the, the area that was given to us. 
Then came the miracle of the Six-Day War, which if we could add chapters to the Bible, this would certainly override many of the, of the miracles which are stated today in the Bible, the whole Bible. The Six-Day War was something else. In fact, if we're going a little bit to speak about it, uh, that we brought down the Soviet Union. Because in Israelis, when we fought the Arabs, we were fighting against Russian equipment and Russian advisors. And we destroyed them. We showed that Russian equipment cannot stand up to Western equipment. And that brought down the Soviet Union in such a way. But to go back to our thing, uh, I think that uh, there are many rabbis in Israel. I don't know exactly why you chose me. Maybe because I'm here 55 years, and that makes a statement. And all of our children were born here. Our children are produced in Israel for domestic use, not for export. And all of our grandchildren here, and all of our great-grandchildren here, and we are part and parcel of this great adventure called the State of Israel. See, but the problem is, you can't explain something which is round to someone who's blind. There's no way. To explain to you what it means to live in Israel is something which, if you're not here, you can understand it. The totalitarian, the, the, the total being of a Jew. They have to walk in the street and just scream out, Shema Yisrael, and you won't even look strange. Walk with Phil in the street. Because this is a home. And everybody's your brother. I recall once I was in the United States, and I had to ask somebody a question, directions, for people ran away from me. Here you sit on a bus, you start talking with anybody. And brothers and sisters here, it's, it's something else. Of course, we have Israel. It's not on the silver plate. Uh, tomorrow or today, actually, we're beginning the holiday, the day that we commemorate uh, the fallen soldiers. 23,544 soldiers were killed to give us where we are today in Medina Israel. But that's equal to two days of Auschwitz. Auschwitz in his prime was killing 10 to 12,000 Jews a day. And uh, that's the number of soldiers. That, of course, everyone that falls, that's the world, the total world to himself. But that's what it is. It's two days of Auschwitz. And the Jews have a choice. You can have a physical Auschwitz or you can have a spiritual Auschwitz. People talk about, I mean, people who are survivors from the camps. And I say, I'm also a survivor. Because losing, we probably lost the United States over the last 70 years. Probably lost six million Jews. That's also a Shoah. It's also a Holocaust of some, some kind. So I'm a survivor too. I'm a survivor. I think that it was put very succinctly several years ago. The Jewish agency put up road signs in, in, in Florida every couple of miles. And the sign said it was directed to Israelis who left the country. We call them Yoradim, those that go down. And the sign said, come home before Abba becomes daddy. And that tells the whole story. But my understanding was that Prime Minister didn't like it, and he told him to take down the signs. But that was the message. Because if you stay there long enough, so Abba, his father, is going to become daddy. Now, I say about Aliyah. Can we wait a little bit, another 50 years? I say they have to have an immediate Aliyah. Every day that you remain there, you're putting your children in jeopardy of assimilation. Now, assimilation doesn't mean that you stop putting on talus and filling, stop that. Assimilation is something else. It's assimilation where you inside, your values become those of the people that you live among. You cannot jump into a pool and remain dry. You're going to live with the Gentiles, you're going to be like them. And then, the most important thing is, I'd say, the most, the foundation stone of Judaism is one idea, one concept. And he was called Atabachatano. You chose us. We are God's chosen people. But this is the fulcrum around where people divide between the men and the boys. Do you believe that God, the creator of all things, the creator, the, 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 the God which we have no idea, who is so great and so almighty, we have no concept of what he is, chose the Jewish people, more than other nations, to be his special people. There are some religious Jews that deny it. They say that Judaism could be the conglomeration 
of uh, rituals or even prophecies, but all people are basically created equal. But that's not Judaism. It may sound nice, liberal Judaism, but that's Judaism is that there are 70 root nations and God chose the Jewish people for something else. People, nations of the world, the Gentiles, were given seven basic commandments. Jews were given 613 basic commandments. And we're judged differently than other nations. We're judged that like a, a parent deals with the child. A parent will not hit the child of a neighbor. That's not my problem. But he punishes his own child. Hashem punishes Jewish people when we don't stand up to the level what he demands of us. But one thing, Jews suffer. But Jews always remain. Jews always remain. The great nations of the world, the great empires, that made a big noise when they were here. 200 years, 200, 400 years, they know there's no sign of them anymore. The Jewish people, the smallest of all the nations, continue on and on till we came back here. I recall <coughs> there's a place called the Bible Land Museum, near the Israeli Museum. And several years ago, they had ex exhibits of 15 ancient capitals that really were the powerhouses in those times. And they showed that not one of them is in existence anymore. And yet, the Jewish people were not an exhibit in anyone's museum. We're the exhibitors. We're not being exhibited. Jewish people are something different. Now, the question is, do you want to be part of that Jewish people? Be part of that excitement? But even different. You want to be part of eternity? Because when Hashem shows us, He gave us eternity. Other peoples of the world, I don't know. I'm a rabbi for Jews, not a rabbi for people who are not Jews. We want to be part of eternity. Not only in this world, Judaism is also, remember, Judaism is like an iceberg. An iceberg is one ninth is above the water, eight ninths under the water. The real part of Judaism is that part of the world which is not the material world, but the spiritual world. And uh, we all get there, and one day we're all going to get there. No one's been able to beat the game. We all live 70, 80, 120 years. But the real life of a person is the next world. And that's where Judaism comes in. It promises a person eternal life. You can believe it or deny it. It's in your hands. But if you believe it, then you have to be able to understand that the place of a Jew is here. i just go back for a moment, if I may, to the story of the sacrificing of Isaac. That Abraham was commanded by Hashem, by God, to take us some Isaac, the Temple Mount, which is 100 meters from this where we're sitting now, and to sacrifice his son. The command was given by God to Abraham. It was not given to Isaac. Isaac could have said, Father, you are commanded. I was not commanded. I don't want to, I'm not cooperating. And if I disagree, so you're off the hook. Because there's no lamb, so there's no sacrifice. Isaac didn't do it. Why? But Isaac said to himself, this is the will of Hashem. That's what God wants. That's what He wants. Then I have to acquiesce to what He wants. He didn't command me. But I don't have to wait for a command. But I know that's what He wants. So I did it. I asked myself the question. Does so God want you to live in Philadelphia? Does God want you to live in Milwaukee? Or does God want you to live in the Holy Land? The answer is quite plain. If you're a cognizant, conscious Jew, and you have to realize God wants you to be here. 2,000 years we could not come here until a British mandate, which ended on May 14th, 1948, which will be my birthday, <laughs> by the way. Uh, the fifth day of Iyar, in the year Tav uh, uh, the British mandate ended, and the gates of Eretzisur were opened for the first time in 2,000 years, and the call came out to all Jews to come home. Many people heard it and they came. Many people don't. And I have a very big problem, not with the laymen. Jews are wonderful people. There are some rabbis out there that are anti-God. How can a rabbi be anti-God? In this world, anything can happen. A rabbi that says to you, well, come when the Mashiach calls us. When Mashiach, Messiah comes. 
I recall being in New York about 30 years ago. I was riding in the subway, and next to me came in two young Hasidim, and they sat next to me and started to talk. They speak English better than me because they're already fifth generation in America and own from the second generation in America. We started to talk and I said, they were Satma, uh, fathers of the Satma Rabbi. He said, when are you coming to Israel? And he said, when Messiah sends a limousine for us, we will come to Israel. He said, you think he's going to send a limousine for you to come to Israel? No, what they're saying was, don't bother us, we're not coming to Israel. And they have a rabbi that backs them. And uh, there have always been, every generation, all kind of leaders that took advantage of their position to control. Religion is a tremendous tool for control. It depends how you control. So I also want to talk about the idea of the Messiah. In terms of the way I see the Messiah, it's a great uh, anesthetic. It puts you to sleep. Don't do anything. Don't move. Wait for the Messiah. Don't build a country. Don't go to the army. Don't work. Mashiach will take care. He'll take care of your overdraft in the bank. Not that way. God made the world for people to do things. It's up to us to do it. If you're up to it, and you can make it, then 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 you then you gain eternity. If not, you want to escape. You're going to escape your Judaism. It's not difficult. If Jane Jane marries uh, Jacob, then you've done it. You finished it already. Uh, I'd like to speak to you about life in, life in this country. Uh, I've been, as I said, 55 years here. Wife and I came in 1962, and the country was before the 60, 1967. 67, that was the, that was the, uh, the, the parting of the ways of the old customs, the new customs of Israel. Before 67, Israel was, let's say, a third world power, a third world country. And we lived, we came from, my wife came from, West, from Western Avenue, Manhattan. I came from Flatbush. And we came, I taught in Yeshiva, in a moshav called Nechalim, between the airport and between Petar Tikva. And we lived in a tzrif. It's a wooden hut. My hair was Lincoln, Lincoln because he had a log cabin. And I had a thin little balls and hut, and that's what it was. Hot in the summer, cold in the winter. And the grass would grow up, would grow between the, 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 the floor. And I taught in the yeshiva, that was life. There's no meat, to speak of no meat, and my feet, meat, Shabbat, only chicken, it was poor. But we loved it. Life was so sweet. And then came the 1967 war, which in itself is a discussion of that war. That was a miracle beyond belief. Everything changed. We became in the most radical way. Aliyah came. Money started coming into the country. And the, the great economic powers that we have today, in it, which is a powerhouse, remember, India wants to make deals with Israel. China is making deals with Israel. Even though we can stay in a hotel, the whole population of Israel can fit into a hotel in Shanghai. These countries are looking for us. Israel technology, Israel brain power. Today, Israel... Already got plans already to building a hundred story building in Ramat Gan. Israel, a hundred story building. This country is rich. People don't realize how much money is in this country. From what? From where? A little country in the edge of the desert with no resources to speak of except the Jewish mind and the blessing of Shem. Want to be a part of it? It's an experience. It's a one time. You go through this world only one time. You don't get another chance. You have to make good of every single day. And there are many excuses that people can say, my children are in school, and uh, uh, when I get panos, when I get work, and this and that. There are a hundred excuses not to do something good. But need one excuse to do something, to do something good. There are many reasons that a Jew should come back home. Religious, or as I said, because to protect your children, or a good life, a feeling. You go to the people say the most comfortable pillow to sleep on at night is a clean conscience. You know, never to have a clean conscience. Of course, if you want to make a living, you'll make a better living there. If you want to make a life, you make a life here. And it's not just words. Now, many people say it. Now, 
it's not easy to make Aliyah. I realize that. I went through it, but my experience was, the most, and other people which I know, the most difficult thing about Aliyah is the moment of decision. That's murder. But the moment that you make it, things fall into place. Try it. Try it out. Uh, what else can I tell you? I know that the words which I'm saying doesn't have in them the ability to, to override all the other reasons to stay where you are. Especially you have today a young uh, uh, new communities like in, in Syracuse, I saw, in Rochester and other places. Young, vibrant religious communities come and take part in the community. We have a young rabbi, we have a mikveh, we have a day school, and everyone gets a private home. It's nice. It's very nice for today. But Judaism always has to look for tomorrow. Because we have a tomorrow. Other people may not have it. Other people may say, live, eat, and live because tomorrow we die. Jews always look for tomorrow. And tomorrow is here in this country. And uh, and many other issues, for example, uh, I have a son, one of my sons, the youngest son, who was a general in the Israeli army. And very special. I don't ever believe me born in Brooklyn and my wife, as I said, in Manhattan, going to have a son who was a general in the Israeli army, infantry general. I have another son who was a building engineer. He just finished the most magnificent hotel in Israel called the Wall of Astoria. It was classified as the eighth most beautiful hotel in the world. Now, the third son that teaches Torah in Hebron. I have three daughters, two of them are midwives, nurses with a specialty in uh, bringing children to the world. Another daughter who is a uh, medical practitioner in a different field. All born in Israel. All went through the, all went through the system. People say, you bring your children out and become re not religious. What are you talking about? Pure religious people. Grandchildren, great grandchildren. What are you talking about? That's only a lush know about the country. Of course, uh, uh, of course, children in America, all of them turn out perfectly 100%, right? All their children are wonderful. Only here they get spoiled. But it doesn't work that way. Uh, again, you cannot explain to someone who's blind what something round is. To come and tell you what life is in Eretz Israel is uh, it's difficult if you don't experience it. You have to come. And I said again, there's a magnet. If you don't feel the attraction, then you have to think maybe I'm not an authentic Jew. Maybe somewhere around the line something happened. My grandfather, great grandma, who knows what. If you feel an attraction to this country. Now, you don't have to be religious to feel the attraction. I have a, a young man who married a cousin of mine. He is a leftist. His friends are Arabs. He received the Israel Prize for making motion pictures, and he produced pictures which uh, betrayed the army not in a good light and other things and so forth. He was in London at the outbreak of the Yom Kippur, and a totally irreligious, and a leftist, and then give away the terror, to give the Arabs whatever they want. He was in London when the Yom Kippur War broke out. He fought tooth and nail to get on a plane to come back here to join his parachute, parachute unit. He had the magnet. He's not religious, okay, that's private thing with him and God. But he has that magnet. He pulled him here. He's going to the thick of the war. Why? Why are you doing that? Because he's a Jew. He's not Jewish, he's a Jew. Of course, it has to be a little bit. You have to round up the corners a little bit with him, but uh, that's what it is. Now, in the name of, tr of, of, of uh, truth, you cannot say everybody walks around here in la-la-la land, everyone is happy and everyone is singing. Life is real here. You have to work for it, make a, like, make a living. You have to get a job, you to need a house, you need a place for your children to study. And it's a real world. It's a real world. And but that already depends between your personal relationship between you, your relationship between you and Hashem. Everyone has their their thing. But once you settle in, then 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 you become part, you feel you become part of the wife your your life has value. 
there's an idea of what you're doing. I say even more in the Holy Land, no such thing as a secular act. I once met a man many years ago who lived in B'nai Brock, and he told me a story that he has a daughter, a teenage daughter, normal in every way, went to Beit Yaakov school, and one day she became very introvertish, closed into herself, come up from school, go into a room, unlock the door, and didn't know what happened to her, suddenly. Suddenly. And then after a while, I questioned her, and she opened up, she said, she never knew what my work was, the man says. And one day, she was riding on a bus with her friends from Petach Tikva to Bnei Brak, and she saw me working on the roads. I paved the roads. And she was so, she was so devastated that her father is working like a common laborer on the road. So I sat down and I said to her, my daughter, right, I'm a common laborer. But on that road that I'm making, millions of people will be going through over the years. This one going, a doctor going to help someone. This one going to learn yeshiva. This one going for another mitzvah. And every person on that road that I paved, I'm going to have a part of their mitzvah. Because the narrative show there's no such thing as a secular act. Whatever you do has religious and spiritual connotation. No matter what your profession is, the very fact that you're doing it in the Holy Land it has a part of spirituality attached to it. It's better today than tomorrow. No one knows what tomorrow can bring. But one thing, the prophets in two places say the same words. Bahar Tzion Tia A Mount Zion, meaning land of Israel, there shall be refuge. Jewish people are saved in Eretz Yisrael, which is not the case on the outside of Eretz Yisrael. Don't be fooled. But certain rabbis, even their uh, great names, if a rabbi says to you, where are you going? Stay here. He's not a legitimate rabbi. A rabbi is someone, his job is to strengthen the Torah and strengthen the Jewish people, not to make the Torah weak. And here, we get strong. Just take the statistics. Just take a look where we are. Eight and a half million people in this country and they're predicting in 2048, 100 years after the establishment of the state, going to reach 15 million. But I say that's wrong. But at some point, <coughs> there's going to be a return of the descendants of the 12 tribes that were, of the tribes that were sent out. And many, many of the Moranos, these are the people from Spain and Portugal, accept the Christianity, that coercion, going to come back. There's a movement going on now all over the world, I said South America and Portugal and, and, and Spain, people to come back. There's such a great future in this country, and also we're not going to remain so small. The biblical boundaries of the country, of state of, of Israel is a huge country. It's not just this little bit at the eastern end of the Mediterranean, between the river of Jordan and between the Mediterranean. Half of Turkey was the land of the Hittites, is, is, is the... Is the uh, biblical land of Israel from where the Euphrates River begins to the Nile River. We take in half of Turkey, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, uh, the Sinai Peninsula to, to the Nile River. Eretz Israel is first as an economic unit. I once read a book about the way each different part of this great land is an economic input to the whole of it. Mountains and the rivers and the, the different even this little country we are now, there are 30 different areas of vegetation. You take your car and you drive half an hour in any direction, a different kind of vegetation. Like the most, the most uh, uh, assorted in the whole world, such a small space. In any event, I see the land of Israel being according to the biblical boundaries. I see how people, in the tens of hundreds of millions of people in the future in this country. My dear brothers and sisters, I say, think about it. The future is in your hands and only in your hands. And everybody has to make the decisions. But if you come here, you become part of the eternal Jewish people. If you stay there, stay there, and you're lost to the Jewish people, and you'll fade from the platform of history.